Michael second talk is about Yamabe invariants. It's going to start now. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. All right. So um, I know that the first lecture was quite a lot of information, um, but kind of yesterday I covered everything I wanted to talk about, about the first part of our story, which is the Yamabe invariant. So remember the general picture is we're starting studying compact complex surfaces from two different points of view. So from one point of view, we're going to forget the complex structure, view it as a smooth four manifold. And then using Ramanian geometry, we built up this invariant, which is called the Yamabe invariant. So let me just give you a quick reminder of what that is. So we had this normalized Einstein Hilbert functional where you just take a metric, you integrate the scalar curvature of that metric over the manifold, and you divide by an appropriate power of the volume. This is done so that if you rescale the metric by a constant C, it doesn't change the value of the functional. However, it does change if you multiply by a positive function. So for a conformal class, this functional varies. But what we showed is that within a conformal class, the functional is bounded below and hence it has an infimum. And we defined this infimum of all the values of the functional in a conformal class to be the Yamabe constant of the conformal class. So this is a real number. And then by the resolution of the Yamabe problem, actually this infimum is always realized by a metric. There is a metric which is equal to the minimum uh, value. And this metric, such metrics are called Yamabe metrics and they're all constant scalar curvature metrics. Okay. And if this invariant is non-positive, then every constant scalar curvature metric in the conformal class is a Yamabe metric. But as we saw, uh, we did an example last time where if you have positive Yamabe constant, there can be constant scalar curvature metrics which aren't Yamabe metrics. So what that means is they have constant scalar curvature, but the value of the functional is actually bigger than this invariant. Okay. And then finally, there's a result of Urban, which says that if you look at all the possible conformal classes on your manifold, these constants are bounded above by the Yamabe constant of the round metric on the sphere of the same dimension. So that guarantees that this supremum exists and is finite. And we call that the Yamabe invariant of the manifold. So this is a diffeomorphism invariant of the manifold built up out of all the possible Ramanian metrics on our manifold. So that's from the point of view of Ramanian geometry. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the other side of the story, which is, well, now we have a complex surface. Let's think about it as a complex manifold. So the invariant that I wanna talk about is the Kodaira dimension. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with the definition of Kodaira dimension, and then I'm gonna talk a bit more about the structure or what we know about uh, compact complex surfaces, the different types, what's known, um, and we'll go from there. Okay, so basically, that's all I'm going to say about the Yamabe invariant today. Now it's about the Kodaira dimension. Okay, so let me start with if X is a complex manifold, dimension N, so here I mean complex dimension N, K sub X, is the top exterior power of the cotangent bundle. So here I mean the holomorphic cotangent bundle, and this is called the canonical bundle. Okay. It's a holomorphic line bundle. So no, mat no matter what X is, you always have this natural holomorphic line bundle on it called the canonical bundle. And this bundle is used in defining the Kodaira dimension. So if X is compact, so note here, I'm not assuming dimension two yet. Okay, this will just, this will be a story that makes sense for any dimension, then later we'll specialize to dimension two. So if X is compact, the dth plurigenus of X is a non-negative integer, which I'll denote by P sub D for the dth plurigenus of X. Okay. 
and that's equal to h0 of x kx to the d. So let me give a couple of equivalent expressions for this. So this is the dimension of the space of the zeroth cohomology of this line bundle, which is the same as the dimension of the space of holomorphic sections of this line bundle. Okay, so kx d here denotes the tensor product of kx with itself d times. So we're only going to consider here uh, d positive. Okay, you could try and do the same thing with d negative and kind of use the inverse of the canonical bundle, but we're only going to talk about the plurigenus for d positive. Okay, so basically the when d is equal to one, the first plurigenus is just the dimension of the space of sections of the canonical bundle, which is just the space of holomorphic n forms, n zero forms. Okay, but for d bigger than one, you just take the tensor product of kx with itself and you look at the space of sections. So unlike in the smooth case, so if you have a smooth vector bundle over a compact manifold, the space of sections is always infinite dimensional because you can use partitions of unity to kind of just get sections which are supported in a neighborhood of a point. And you can take smaller, like you can take bump functions and so on. So this space will be infinite dimensional in the smooth case, but in the complex case, if you have a holomorphic vector bundle and you take the space of sections over a compact manifold, this will always be finite. Okay, so this thing here is always, is a non-negative integer. So it could be zero. And so it could be that the only section, the only holomorphic section is the zero section. So you always have the zero section of any vector bundle. Sometimes that's the only holomorphic section you have. Other times there are others, but it, the space of sections is a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, so the plurigenus is just counting the dimension of that that space. Okay, so the definition of Kodaira dimension depends on these plurigenera, these numbers that we produce, the various d. So the first case is that the plurigenera are zero for all d. So that's like a special case where they're all zero, no matter what D you pick, there's no sections other than the zero section. So in this case, we say X has Kodaira dimension minus infinity, okay, denoted so I'll use kappa of x to denote the Kodaira dimension minus infinity. So I'll say later why we choose this specific convention of minus infinity other than something else. Turns out this is the right choice to have a certain property later on. Okay, so what if there's some plurigenus which isn't zero? Okay, so otherwise, so first I'm gonna give a numerical characterization of the Kodaira dimension, which is maybe a little bit opaque, but has some intuition. Then I'll give a geometric characterization. So there's several different equivalent definitions of the Kodaira dimension. I'll mention two of them here. Um, if you're looking for kind of a more in-depth discussion, I think Lazarsfeld's book on positivity and algebraic geometry does a good job of discussing some of these various notions if you're interested. Okay, but first I wanna define it as follows. So we define, so in the case that there's some plurigenus which is non-zero, which is to say some tensor power of the canonical bundle admits a non, a section which isn't the zero section. So we define the Kodaira dimension to be lim sup as d approaches infinity of the logarithm of plurigenera 
divided by the logarithm of d. So this takes some thinking about. So obviously, if you know we couldn't use this definition for the Kodaira dimension when all the pluriogenera are zero, because you'd be taking log of zero every single time. Okay, so amongst the d where this is non-zero, you can take their logarithm and divide by the logarithm of d. So what's what's this really trying to capture? Okay, so. So kappa of x equals, uh, let's say, kappa greater than zero, if and only if the plurigenera are big O of D to the kappa, i.e. the sequence of numbers P D of X D equals one to infinity grows like a polynomial in D of degree kappa. Okay. So this kind of definition here is trying to make precise this notion that this sequence of numbers is growing like a polynomial in D and the Kodaira dimension is determining the degree of that polynomial. Okay. So note, if I have log of something like D to the kappa divided by log of D, this is kappa log D over log D equals kappa. Okay, so if it's on the nose a monomial of degree K, then you'll see that the Kodaira dimension is kappa, but in general, it just has to be O of D to the K. So it's kind of bounded below and above by a constant times D to the K. Okay, so what's not obvious from this definition are the possible values of the Kodaira dimension. So not obvious. But the result is an integer between zero and n, which is remember the dimension of x. Okay, so this definition gives us some intuition of what it's trying to capture. It's kind of how quickly is the space of sections growing as d varies. It's growing like a polynomial of a certain degree, and that degree is the Kodaira dimension. But you know, it could have, you know, this could have been a half, right? It's not at all clear that it couldn't be a half or, you know, bigger than n, right? So kind of this is surprising and nowhere near intuitive. Now I want to give a second definition, which is more geometric, and then it'll be clear that this is true. Okay. So here's a more geometric approach. Okay. So let L be a holomorphic line bundle. So this is in practice, we're going to use this for kx to the d. And suppose that it has sections other than the zero section. Okay, so suppose it's a holomorphic line bundle and there exist sections other than the zero section. Then associated to this line bundle, there is a partial map VL from X to the projectivization of the space of sections D. 
dualized. Okay, so let me explain this for a sec. What do I mean by a partial map? So that's what this dotted arrow represents. It's a partial map. What it means is the domain is not all of X, but a subset of X. Okay, so it's a non-empty subset of X where this map is defined. And then there's a indeterminate region where the map isn't defined. And what I'm doing is I'm taking points of X, which are in the domain and I'm mapping them to, first I take this vector space, which I know is not a trivial vector space, taking the dual, and then project revising it. So looking at the one dimensional subspaces. Okay, so what is the map? How do I define it? Okay. okay. So if you have a point in X, it maps. So what do I have to map it to? So I have to send a point here, X, to, well, something in this space defined up to scale. So what's an element of this space? It's a linear functional on this vector space. So a map from the space of sections of L to C. So it maps to the evaluation map X at X from the space of sections to C. So what is the evaluation map? So you apply it to a section. So what is S? S is a section of this line bundle. So a map from the base X to the total space L. And all you do is you just evaluate that section at the fixed point X. So this is just S of X. Now, where does that lie? it lies in the fiber over X. So L sub X is the fiber of the line bundle L over the given point X. And because it's a complex line bundle, this is isomorphic to C. However, there is no canonical isomorphism between LX and C. So before I do this isomorphism, I've just got a map from the space of sections to the fiber. But if I want an element of the dual, it has to be a map from the space of sections to C. So I have to identify that fiber with C, but my choice of identification will change the element of this dual space I get. Right, so in order to get a map, an element of the dual space, I have to choose an isomorphism. And there's more than one isomorphism to do that. So I might get different elements of the dual space. But what you note, and this is why we projectivize. So however, given any to isomorphisms, say psi one and psi two, there is A in C star So any two isomorphisms differ by a constant rescaling by a non-zero number. So if I try and look at the element of the dual space I produce by doing this with this isomorphism being phi one, then I get an element of the dual space. But if I use phi two, I get a different element of the dual space, namely A times the original one. But in the projectivization, that factor of A doesn't matter. Those two elements define the same element of the projectivization because they're constant rescalings of one another. So therefore, the evaluation map at X gives a well-defined element of the projectivization XL star, except
if the evaluation map is the zero map. Okay. So, because remember, when you projectivize, what do you do? You take your vector space, you remove the zero vector, and then you mod out by rescalings by non-zero complex numbers. So if my the map I produce in this way is just the zero map, that is every section evaluated at X is zero, then that won't give me an element of this space. So this is where the partial map story comes in. Right? So the reason this is partial is we have to throw away those points where this map we've produced is the zero map because that doesn't give us an element here. So the base locus of L, which I'll denote by BS of L, is the set of X values, set of X, for which the evaluation map of X is the zero map. So I, all the sections of L vanish at X. So the domain of this map we've defined is the complement of the base locus. So given any holomorphic line bundle, we get a map to a projective space, provided that line bundle has sections other than the zero section. But it's not defined on the whole manifold. You have to throw some stuff away first, namely the base locus. Okay, another way of thinking about this map is that you can think about the projectivization of the dual of a vector space as a set of hyperplanes in that vector space. And given a point X, the hyperplane you're producing is basically the kernel of the corresponding evaluation map. Okay. So this is a thing you can do for any holomorphic line bundle with sections. You get these maps. So how does this relate to Kodaira dimension? Well, if the canonical bundle uh, sorry, if the Kodaira dimension is not minus infinity. Right? So the above story only works if you have a line bundle with sections other than zero section. This is, you know, Kodaira dimension minus infinity is the case where all the tensor powers of the canonical bundle don't have sections. So if you're not in that case, you have some tensor power which has sections. There's a relationship between the Kodaira dimension as we defined before and these maps we've got here. So then K, kappa of X is equal to the largest dimension of the image of X under the maps V KX to the D. So what we have here is that a line bundle with sections, we've produced a map. Okay, so now we have a whole family of line bundles. So we have a whole family of maps. What we do is we look at the image of X under these maps, okay? And we say, what's the dimension of the image? And what's the biggest the dimension is amongst all of these maps? So now this is clear that the, the number we're producing is an integer between zero and N. You can't have a holomorphic map increase to dimension, but it can decrease, right? So Kodaira dimension zero, you can think of X as being collapsed to a point under these maps. And then everything intermediate is, well, it's not zero dimensional, one, two, three, and so on. Okay, so this is a more geometric way of thinking about it. And I should point out that we choose the convention K 
Okay, so with this choice of convention being minus infinity rather than minus one in some other places, with this choice of convention, we actually have the property that the Kadar dimension of a product is the sum of Kadar dimensions. So let's do an example. So let's do, let's look at Riemann surfaces. Let's look at the Kadar dimension of Riemann surfaces. Okay, so let me remind you. The degree of a holomorphic line bundle over a Riemann surface C yeah I should also make explicit when I say Riemann surface I mean one complex dimensional whereas when I say complex surface I mean two complex dimensional okay so this is one complex dimensional so the degree of a holomorphic line bundle over a Riemann surface is the integral of the first churn class of that line bundle over X. And the reason I bring it up is that it, this degree can give us information about sections of L. Namely, if the degree of L is negative, then the only section of L is the zero section. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is consider Riemann surfaces by their, by classified by their genus and see how does that affect their Kadara dimension. So let's start with the genus being zero. Then if you look at the degree of one of these line bundles we care about, so we care about the space of sections of these bundles. So I'm gonna take their degree. If I can show they're zero, then or sorry, if they're negative, then I'll know there's no sections. So let's have a look. So the degree is multiple the degree of a tensor power, the, t the power comes down and this follows from this formula here. And then it follows from knowledge about the first churn class and the relationship between the canonical bundle and the tangent bundle of X, that the degree of the canonical bundle is always minus the Euler characteristic on a Riemann surface. Okay. So if the genus is zero, the Euler characteristic is two. So this is minus 2D, which is negative. So what did this tell us? The D plus genus, which is the dimension of the space of sections has to be zero because all of these bundles have negative degree. So the Kadar dimension of a genus zero Riemann surface is minus infinity. Okay. If G equals one, then the canonical bundle of X, right? So on a torus, the canonical bundle of X is trivial. It's a trivial bundle. So in particular, a trivial bundle has lots of sections. They're just maps from the base into C. Holomorphic maps. So in particular, they're only constant, but there are other maps aside from just the zero section. So if we look at the D genus, which is the dimension of the space of sections, of kx to the d, 
well, because kx is trivial, this is just the trivial bundle to the D. But if you take tensor powers of the trivial bundle, you just get the trivial bundle. Okay. So what is the space of sections of a trivial Landau bundle? It's just your holomorphic functions on your base. Right? But if X is compact, the only holomorphic functions are constant. So I should say dimension here. So all the plurigenera are one. So in particular, the Kadai dimension is not minus infinity. So if I look at the sequence of numbers generated by my plurigenera, it's one, 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 one. So as a polynomial in D, that's like a constant polynomial. So it's a polynomial of degree zero. So the Kadara dimension of X is zero because that's the, de the degree of the polynomial when I think of these sequence of ones. So basically, if the Kadara dimension is zero, you effectively have either all ones or in some examples, you can have zeros and ones, but basically it's effectively constant. It doesn't grow, right? Because it's like a polynomial in degree zero. If G is at least two, Then it's a little bit more complicated, but we can use Riemann rock. We have Okay, so this is what Riemann Rock says if I apply it for the line bundle kx to the d. So note that the degree of kx to the one minus d is one minus d times the degree of kx. So it's one minus d minus the Euler characteristic. So it's D minus one times two minus two G. Okay, so G is at least two. So two minus two G is negative. And D minus one. So this is either zero if D equals one or less than zero if D is bigger than one. Okay. So for D bigger than one, we have h zero of x kx d, and then it would be minus this term, but the degree of that line bundle is negative, so it has no sections, so this is zero. So it's equal to the degree of the kx d minus g plus one. And remember h zero is just the plurigenus. genus. So this is d times the degree of kx minus g plus one, which is d times minus the Euler characteristic. This is two g minus two minus g plus one. So I can write this as two d lots of g minus one minus g minus one. So this is two d minus one g minus one. So this only works for D bigger than one. But if I think about the sequence of numbers I'm getting here, it's given by this. So as a function of D, remember G is a fixed number, it's the genus, and it's bigger than or equal to two. So this thing is always positive. This is a linear polynomial in D. So the Kadara dimension of X 
is one. That's the degree of this polynomial. Okay. So for Riemann surfaces, the Kadara dimension has three possible values, minus infinity, zero, and one. And these can be determined in terms of the genus. So they are zero, one, and at least two respectively. Maybe it's not surprising that for Riemann surfaces, there's this really nice correspondence because everything is a very low dimension. There's so much, so many coincidences that happen in complex dimension one or real dimension two that don't generalize to higher dimensions. Okay? And you shouldn't expect something like this to generalize to higher dimensions, but in complex dimension one, we have this nice kind of correspondence between the genus, which is a topological thing, and the Ferrari dimension, which is a complex geometric thing. So now I want to use this to focus on complex surfaces. Okay, so this is what the Kadara dimension kind of gives us in terms of Riemann surfaces. It nicely classifies Riemann surfaces into three types. You know, if you also think in terms of uniformization, you know, genus zero has universal cover CP1, genus one has universal cover C. Genus at least two has universal cover of the upper half plane or the unit disk. So this trichotomy kind of fits in well with other trichotomies we know for these Riemann surfaces. This, you know, the collection of complex surfaces is much more vast and much more complicated. Okay. So I want to talk about them for a bit. What, what can we say about classifying these surfaces? And do we have something kind of nice like this? Okay, so the first thing I want to point out is that starting in complex dimension two, there's an operation that you can do that doesn't really do anything in complex dimension one. Okay, and this is called a blow up. So in complex dimension one, a blow up doesn't change the surface, but in complex complex dimension two or above, you can blow things up and produce a new complex manifold. Okay. So let me mention what this is. So I should also mention, if you're looking for a reference for compact complex surfaces, a really good reference, kind of the best one that I know of is Bath, Bullock, Peters, and Van de Ven, called compact. Like surfaces. Alternatively, there's a lot of papers by Kadira written in the 60s, which actually use pretty uh, modern notation. So basically kind of what we use today is mostly what he introduced and a lot of the results kind of are due to him. So those papers are actually quite readable if you're looking for certain kind of particular statements that aren't in that book. Okay, so let me describe uh, what a blow up is. So, if Y is a complex submanifold of X of co dimension K, so that's the dimension of x minus the dimension of y, then the blow up of x along y along y is a new complex manifold, which I'll denote by BL sub y of x which comes equipped with a holomorphic map pi from the blow up back to x 
such that a couple of things are true. So first, if you restrict the map, so inside of X, we have this submanifold Y. I'm going to look at the complement of that submanifold Y, but I'm going to look at the pre-image of it over here. So I'm going to look at the inverse image of the complement of Y in X. Okay. So first is that this is a biholomorphism. Okay, so basically away from the submanifold Y we picked, we're not changing the complex manifold, kind of staying the way it is. So the question is what's happening along Y? What are we doing? So now if you look at E, which will, I would define to be the pre-image of Y, then this is a complex, Submanifold of co dimension one in the blow up. Okay, so we started with a Y which has co dimension K, and then in the blow up, we've, inc we've decreased the co dimension or we've increased the dimension of what from whatever Y's dimension is, we've made it bigger to form E. So it's now co-dimension one. So we've taken a sub-manifold and we've replaced it by what's called a divisor. Okay. Moreover, you can say something about what the projection, the map pi looks like when restricted to this E, okay? So over Y, this map, is a CP K minus one bundle. Okay, so it's a holomorphic fiber bundle whose fiber is CP K minus one. Remember K is the co-dimension of our original submanifold. And you can say what it is, it's the projectivization of the normal bundle. Of Y and X. So if Y has co dimension K in X, then it's normal bundle has dimension K. So if I projectivize that bundle, I get a CP K minus one bundle over Y. That's exactly what this is. So I'm going to, I tried to learn yesterday how to draw a picture of this, but there are pictures on the internet. So I'm going to show you one of those instead. Okay, so I'm going to show you what happens, what kind of the representation of what happens if you blow up a point, right? So if I have the co-dimension is the full dimension, so Y is just a point. In the case of complex dimension two, so this is, you can all see that. So I think of the blue disc as sitting inside of my original complex manifold X and my central point is Y. That's the submanifold I'm blowing up. Okay. So what happens is that the pre and then the surface yellow above is the region of the blow up over this disc. So the vertical red line is the one dimensional, it's the co-dimension one submanifold corresponding to the point I've blown up. Okay, so you can see in this picture, it's a P1. And then all these lines through the origin, or this point that I've got correspond to lines upstairs. They're kind of twisted around. Okay, so this blow up is an operation that takes a while to get used to. But kind of what it does is it replaces a submanifold with something of co-dimension one. Okay, so it increases the dimension of that submanifold, but away from the submanifold, nothing changes. And that's particularly useful when you're trying to resolve singularities. If you have a singular submanifold, 
has a singular point, you can blow it up and hopefully that singularity goes away in the blow up. Yeah, that's one application of blow ups. But if you're interested in complex surfaces or complex manifolds in general, you have to be aware of this operation and how it changes things because it can produce new manifolds from the ones you start with. Okay, so let me point out a couple of things. If K equals one, right, so we're starting with something, a sub-manifold of co-dimension one, then we're supposed to produce a new manifold where the pre-image of Y has co-dimension one, but it already has co-dimension one. So if the co-dimension is already one, then the blow up, is just the original manifold and the map pi is just the identity. Okay, so this is why in complex dimension one for Riemann surfaces, this operation doesn't give us anything because if you have a one dimensional complex manifold, then every sub manifold is either one dimensional, which is the whole manifold if it's connected, or it's a point. Right? But then it has co dimension one, so its blow up doesn't change anything. So it's only starting in complex dimension two that blow ups actually change things, right? So in the special case that Y is a single point, then you can say something about what this manifold looks like when you blow up a point and from a, a smooth point of view. Okay. Then there is an orientation preserving diffeomorphism between the blow up of X at X and the connected sum of X with CPN with its reverse orientation. So the bar here means CPN has a natural orientation, the one induced by the complex manifold structure. The bar means I'm taking the other orientation. So these two manifolds are not only diffeomorphic, the diffeomorphism preserves the orientation. So this is useful to understand kind of what, does it, what do these manifolds look like when you blow up? Kind of describing a blow up for something which is in a point is more complicated. Okay. You might ask, well, okay, now we can produce these new manifolds. I start with a complex manifold and I blow it up along a point or some sub manifold. How does that relate to this invariant we just defined, the Kadar dimension? So, the Kadar dimension of a blow up at a point is the same as X. So, the Kadar dimension doesn't change under blowing up under a point or more generally blowing up in general, but in complex dimension two, in complex dimension two, blowing up at a point is really all there is to do, because if you blow up at a, along a one dimensional submanifold, then by this remark, you're not changing anything. So the only time you get a new surface is when you blow up at a point. And what this tells us is that if you blow up at a point, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the Kodari dimension. So now in complex dimension two, two. So what I said is we can only blow up points if we want to obtain new manifolds. So we say X is minimal. if it cannot be obtained by blowing up another surface. So there's, you know, you have a surface, it may be the blow up of something else or it might not be. If it's not, we call that minimal. In some sense, it can't be produced via this procedure. Okay. 
So we say X is a minimal model for X primed if X primed can be, well, two things. First, X has to be minimal. And X primed can be obtained from X by a series of blow ups. So what I mean by that is you start with X, you blow up a point, then you pick a point on that, you blow that up, you pick a point on that, you blow that up, and eventually you get to X primed. That's what it means for X to be the, a minimal model of X primed. Okay, so now that we have the Kadara dimension and the notion of a blow up and what it means to be minimal, that is it can't be obtained from a blow up, we can state a classification result for complex surfaces. So this is kind of similar to the result we saw at the end of the previous section where the Kodara dimension of a Riemann surface was related to kind of these three families of complex, complex manifolds of dimension one, right? This trichotomy of genus zero, one, and greater equal to two. Kind of elliptic, parabolic, hyperbolic. Unfortunately, in complex dimension two, it's much more complicated, so there's more possibilities and there's more families, but we have some sort of classification. And this is known as the Kadira Enriquez classification. So it's named after the two because Enriquez was more focused, he's from like the Italian algebraic geometry school. So he was focused on algebraic surfaces, uh, whereas Kadira was considered considering all complex surfaces. So Kadira's came later. So this is the theorem. So it's Kadira. Enriquez classification. So every connected compact complex surface has a minimal model in exactly one of these families. Okay, so given a complex surface, I claim that it's always a blow up. It's always a blow up of some minimal surface. And that minimal surface belongs to one of the following families I'm gonna write down. Okay. So I'm gonna organize it in a table where the Kadara dimension, uh, I'll write it like this. So the Kadara dimension will be one parameter and then there'll be another thing which is the first Betty number of X. I'll split it up into even and first Betty number odd. Okay. So first we've got Kadara dimension minus infinity. So there are what's called rational surfaces and ruled surfaces. If B1 is even and if B1 is odd, we have what's called class seven surfaces. So class seven dates back to Kadara's classification. He used the, he introduced that terminology. Kadara dimension zero, there are tori, just like in complex dimension one, Kadara dimension zero were elliptic curves or tori of dimension one, tori of dimension two are also Kadara dimension zero. There are K3 surfaces. There are hyper elliptic, and there are Enriquez surfaces. B1 is odd, we have what's called primary Kodaira surfaces and secondary Kodaira surfaces. K3 
Tetrahedral dimension one, you have properly elliptic. And properly elliptic. And Kadara dimension two, if B1 is even, we have general type. And if B1 is odd, there is nothing. So this is empty. So let me just put the empty set here. Okay, so if you have Kadara dimension two, you automatically have B1 even. Okay, so this is a complete list of all the classes of minimal complex surfaces. So all complex surfaces can be obtained by taking one of these and blowing up at some number of points. So it's a bit more in depth than the uh, Riemann surface classification. So in the Riemann surface case, B1 is even automatically, right? The Euler characteristic is the first Betty number is equal to two times the genus. So it's always even. So this column doesn't appear. And we also only have three numbers rather than four. But in complex dimension two, we get a bunch of more examples that can't arise in complex dimension one. So let me give some explanation of what are all these things. Okay, because it's not obvious. So a rational surface. Is a surface by rational to CP2. So what does that mean? You can be obtained from CP2 by a series of blowups and blowdowns. So I didn't mention blowdowns, I've talked about blowups, but blowdown is just the opposite. You start with something which is a blowup and then you use the map pi to produce the blowdown. Okay, so by starting with CP2, blowing up some points, doing some blowdowns and repeating this process, you get a rational surface. All rational surfaces are obtained this way. So let me say, the only minimal rational services are, um, well, CP2 itself, and what's called the Hertzbrook services. denoted by sigma sub n, which is the projectivization of O of n plus O over CP1. And this is for n equal to zero and n at least two. So these are all CP1 bundles over CP1. So rational surfaces make up one family. Ruled surfaces So what are they? They are CP1 bundles over a Riemann surface of genus at least one. So all of these Hertzbrook surfaces are CP1 bundles over a genus zero Riemann surface. Ruled surfaces are CP1 bundles over a genus, a surface of genus at least one. Okay. So you can show they are all of the form, the projectivization of E to a Riemann surface C, where E to C has rank two. So you take some Riemann surface, take a holomorphic vector bundle of rank two, you projectivize it, get a CP1 bundle over C. All rule surfaces are obtained this way. And this is special to 
being over a Riemann surface, if you try to replicate this in higher dimensions, you say just I have a CP1 bundle over a complex manifold, that CP1 bundle is not necessarily the projectivization of a rank two bundle, but over a Riemann surface it is. Okay. So what's next? So we've done rational ruled. What about class seven? So the name gives absolutely nothing away and neither will the definition. So class seven surfaces. <clears throat> surfaces with Kadara dimension minus infinity and B1 odd. So the definition of class seven surfaces are they are the surfaces which fit here. There's no like intrinsic characterization like we have for ruled and rational where I say, oh, these are what ruled and rational surfaces are and they fit in this box. Class seven, sur sur class seven surfaces are defined to be those which fit in this box. Okay, so. Examples include Hopf surfaces and inner way surfaces. If you've heard of those. So we'll talk about class seven surfaces later on. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on those, but these are some examples of class seven surfaces. Okay, so tori are of the form C2 mod a lattice. So just like in any dimension, you can do this. So it's a lattice. That is a free abelian group, free abelian subgroup of maximal rank. So it's isomorphic to Z4. K3 is a complex surface where the canonical bundle is trivial and the first Betty number is zero. Okay, so Tori have trivial canonical bundle as well. But they don't have first Betty number zero. They have first Betty number four. It actually follows that these are simply connected. And in fact, there's a 20 dimensional family of K3 surfaces, but they're all diffeomorphic. Okay, so an example of a K3 surface is the so-called Fermat quartic, which is a set of points, x naught, x1, x2, x3 in CP3, such that the sum of their fourth powers. Equals zero. Okay, so this is a polynomial which is homogeneous, which means if I rescale each of the elements by a constant, the whole equation is rescaled by a power of that constant, namely k, like the fourth power. So because it's homogeneous, this zero set makes sense in the projective space. This thing is a K3 surface you can show. Okay, but there's many others. There's lots of them. <clears throat> So also in Kadara dimension zero, B1 even. So we had four things, Tori and K3, now hyperelliptic and Enriquez. So hyperelliptic, so this, uh, so these are finitely covered by a product of elliptic curves. Okay. So what do I mean by elliptic curve? I mean a Riemann surface of genus zero, uh, genus one, sorry. So you have a complex torus of dimension one, you take another complex torus of dimension one, possibly a different torus, take their product. That's, a tor that's an example of a torus, right? And then you take a finite group action and take the quotient. These things are the hyperelliptic surfaces. So these are completely classified. You know which elliptic, uh, curves you can take and what the possible group actions are. Okay, so I should point out not every torus is a product of elliptic curves. Okay, that, that puts a restriction on what these lattices look like. 
Okay, so some tori are a product of two elliptic curves, some tori aren't. Okay, in fact, generically, they won't be. Okay, this is somewhat a special situation, but in the special situation that you have a torus, which is a product of two elliptic curves, provided the elliptic curves are right, sometimes they admit a free group action, a finite group action, and the quotient is what we call hyperelliptic. So an Enrique's surface, which is the last thing in that box, which is B1 even, could I already mention zero? Here's a surface with Kx squared, which remember is Kx tends to Kx, trivial, but the canonical bundle is not trivial. Okay, so it doesn't have trivial canonical bundle, but the second tense, the power does. So this is, this condition here rules out K3 beat surfaces being in the same class as Enrique's surfaces. So they're complete, they're different, but there is a relationship between Enrique's surfaces and K3 surfaces. Namely that every Enrique's surface is double covered by, sorry, I also need B1 equals zero here. Double covered by a K3 surface. Okay, and the reason it's a double covering is precisely because we've got the second tensor power here. That's, that's how you construct the double covering. Okay, so hyperelliptic and Enriquez surfaces are quotients of tori and K3, respectively. That's why I've written the kind of tori and K3 here, and then hyperelliptic and Enriquez below, because they're just quotients of what's above them in the box. Okay, so let's move on to primary and secondary Kadaira. So primary Kadira surface. Is a surface with B1 equal to three. It's in particular odd as it's supposed to be. And is a holomorphic. Fiber bundle of elliptic curves over an elliptic curve. Okay. So it has fibers elliptic curves, so tori of dimension one, and a base, a torus of dimension one. Okay, so an example. Take L over a complex torus of dimension one, non trivial line bundle. Let Z be the image of the zero section. Then I take X to be. First, I take the total space of the line bundle, remove the zero section. So this is a non-compact complex surface, but then I take an action by the integers. Where this action acts by, uh, let's say, L goes to 2L. Okay, so I rescale in the fibers. So in the fibers, I'm just getting C star mod this Z action. That's a complex torus of dimension one. And then over the base of complex torus dimension one. Because L is a non-trivial line bundle, you can show that the first Betty number is three using the Giesen sequence, for example. Okay, so this is an example of a primary Kadara surface. And just as 
up here, I wrote kind of things in the second line as quotients of things in the first. Secondary Kadara surfaces are quotients of primary Kadara surfaces. Secondary Kadara surface. is a surface which is finitely covered by a primary Kadara surface. Okay. So now we've only got properly elliptic and general type to go. Okay. So an elliptic surface is a surface X, which admits a map. P to a Riemann surface C such that almost all fibers are elliptic curves. So there's a finite set of what's called singular fibers where it doesn't have to be a elliptic curve. Could be a kind of a, not even a smooth manifold. It could be singular. Okay, but aside from those finite fibers, it's elliptic curve everywhere else. Okay, so that's what an elliptic surface is. And a properly elliptic surface is an elliptic surface with Kadara dimension one. Okay. So elliptic surfaces can have Kadara dimension minus infinity, zero or one, can't be two. Okay, so we call it properly elliptic if it has Kadara dimension one. Finally, X is of general type. If the canon, if the Kadara dimension is two. Okay, so just like class seven surfaces, it's defined to be the things in that box. General type are just defined to be the things with Kadara dimension two. Just so happens that all of those have B1 even because they all embed in projective space. Okay. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about this next time. So examples. There are lots of these. There's no hope of classifying them kind of beyond this. Say, so you take hypersurfaces in CP3 of degree at least five. So we saw an example of a K3 surface was you take this degree four polynomial, you look at the zero set inside of CP3. <clears throat> if you do the same thing with degree five or higher polynomial, then provided the polynomial has certain generic properties, then what you get is a general type surface. Okay, so you can compute the you can compute the Kadara dimension or information about the canonical bundle from this degree. Okay. So I think. So that's a lot to take in. There's lots of different classes here if you've not seen them before. But the point is there is a classification. Some pieces are better understood than others. Um, and I think, 
yeah, I think I'll start next time. I'll talk about what the relevance is between the two columns we've got. So we've talked about Kodara dimension that gives us a way of classifying surfaces. But then we've also now split up into B1 even and B1 odd. And next time I'll talk about well, what, is, what is kind of the significance of doing that? What does that mean? Um, in particular, B1 even means certain things, which B1 odd doesn't mean. And uh, that will relate to kind of our first steps to answering the question will be, we'll have one answer if B1 is even, and then we'll wonder if B1 is odd, do we still have the same answer or does it change? Okay, so I think I will leave it there for today. Thank you very much. Any question? All right, thanks to Mike for this nice survey of uh, classification of complex surfaces.